Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. We have a lot to get to tonight. There is so much bad news swirling all around us every minute of every hour of every single day. The worst of this pandemic is still ahead of us, even with a vaccine. There is light, though, at the end of this long, dark tunnel. But we've got to make it through the darkest and most treacherous parts of the tunnel before returning to a life that we recognize. Despite that, right now, just for a moment, though, I want you to sit back and enjoy 91-year-old Martin Kenyon of London, England. I'd like you to tell us how you came to get the vaccine this morning, how it happened. I rang up uh, Guy's Hospital, which I know very well, so I've lived in London most of my grown-up life, and uh, I said, what's this thing? You're doing the vaccination. They said, yes. And then they spent various times asking me questions about this and that, not very interesting, and I said, yes, no, yes, no. And they said, we'll come at half past 12. Of course, I couldn't damn well find anywhere to park my car, so I was late. Um, anyway, I'm here now, and um, I got inside, and they duly put me down a list. I went off and had a rather nasty lunch, and then came back, and um, they were ready for me. How do you feel that you are now one of the first people in the country to have received the first dose of this vaccine? <laughs> one of the first people in the world. How do you feel about it? I don't think I feel about it at all, except that I hope I aren't not going to have the bloody bug now. <laughs> I don't intend to have it because I've got granddaughters and I want to live a long time to enjoy their lives. There's no point in dying now when I haven't lived this long, is there? Mr. Kenyon was part of a, an historic day in the UK as the first Pfizer vaccines were actually injected into people's arms. This morning, 90-year-old Margaret Keenan, a former jewelry shop assistant, became the first person in the world to receive the vaccine. The second person, and I kid you not, was an 81-year-old named William Shakespeare. Soon, we could see similar images here in the U.S. And a little hope that com can't come soon enough. Here in the U.S., the FDA declared the Pfizer vaccine safe and effective, meaning emergency approval could be just days away. But we also learned today that the Trump administration passed on the chance to lock in millions more doses of the Pfizer vaccine last summer when it had the chance. Because, of course, they did. But change is on the way. It really is. For instance, today the president-elect unveiled the public health system that will actually have to handle public, public health team that will actually have to handle the distribution and delivery of this vaccine. Vaccines in a vial only work if they're injected into an arm of people, especially those most at risk. This would be one of the hardest and most costly operational challenges in our nation's history. Getting vaccines to Americans, getting Americans to take the vaccine, rolling it out fairly, this is going to be the 2021 version of the space race. We are watching history and we are living history. The next chapter began today. And starting us off tonight, Dr. Kavita Patel. She's a physician and the former health policy director for the Obama White House and Kathleen Sebelius. She's the former secretary of health and human services under the Obama administration. Dr. Patel, I want to start with you. We were really all heartened, not just because those are adorable older British people, <laughs> um, but we were really heartened by those scenes out of the United Kingdom today. Um, but a new report from the Coronavirus Task Force suggests the vaccine won't alter uh, the course of the pandemic in this country until next spring. Do you agree with that timeline as it's laid out? I do. And Zerlina, here's why. First of all, I have like tears in my eyes looking at the promise and reading the data that Pfizer submitted to the FDA because there is a safe and effective vaccine. And we hope we'll see the same from Moderna. But to your point and your question, I think that people have to understand the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting the virus and potentially transmitting it until we have a certain proportion of the population immunized. So you, it, just to put it even more bluntly, for 10,000 people who get the, vaccine, get the vaccine, only two of those people will get an infection compared to about 37 people who don't get the vaccine. So we still have so many Americans that are going to get the virus and unfortunately, Zerlina, die from the virus because truly put, we can't flip a light on 
and get the entire country vaccinated. So it is definitely at 200,000 cases of coronavirus a day. We are still looking at millions and millions and millions of more cases. And again, those deaths that go with it. That's an important reality check, um, because I think with the vaccine news, folks are almost like letting their foot off the gas in some ways. And we have to remember that the scientists are saying and the doctors, most importantly, are saying we have to keep doing the masking and the social distancing and all of the advice up up until uh, we do get that vaccine. Secretary Sebelius, today, President elect Biden uh, promised that his administration would oversee the injection of 100 million vaccine shots within the first 100 days. And they vowed to reopen a majority of schools across the nation in the same time frame. Do you think that is a realistic time time frame in, uh, in your opinion? Well, I think if the manufacturer's uh, projections are correct, hopefully by the time the Biden administration comes into office, we actually could have two safe and effective vaccines. Uh, the data on the Moderna model will come to the FDA a week after Pfizer, which is uh, on the, you know, in the meetings this week. So we could have two vaccine candidates. We could have the possibility of ramping up uh, production quickly with both vaccine candidates. And I think that is realistic. It is, as uh, the president-elect has said, uh, the most enormous logistical challenge, I think, that we've ever faced as a country uh, because of cold storage requirements, because it requires some um, real um, effort to get to the right place and the right people. We have to be totally transparent. We need to make sure that the most vulnerable populations, that the underserved communities have equal access. And you know, I, I am thankful that the Biden administration will do everything in a very transparent way and will use the maximum resources of the federal government, which have not been brought to bear on anything but the speed of the vaccine development. That's good news. Everything else has been deferred to governors or private sector and hasn't gone very well. So I worry about these opening days of distribution, and I'm eager for the federal plan to come in, make it clear to governors what the federal government will do, what their logistics will be, how much financing they'll put into this effort, and then governors and mayors and hospital administrators and others can do their job getting people ready to go. Yeah, it seems to me like, you know, so far leaving it to the governors and the local leaders hasn't gone well because there's such a spectrum um, of ideology. And so some governors are not inclined to follow the science and heed the advice, and some are. And and we can't do that because it's a virus that's affecting the whole nation. It doesn't care which state you live in, what community. Dr. Patel, I want to ask you about the reporting of the New York Times that I mentioned earlier about the Trump administration passing on the chance to buy more Pfizer vaccines um, back when they had the chance. How far could that set this country back in terms of availability of vaccines uh, to be distributed in an equitable way? Yeah, it's, it, it could be an important setback. And honestly, Zerlina, we haven't heard a really good rationale for why they passed. And, and really what happened is Operation Warp Speed had the right to kind of buy this in advance. And they only had to pay in the event that this was a safe and effective vaccine. So in a way, it was as risk-free as you could probably make it for the federal government. And yet they passed. And it's truly not clear why. There's a lot of back and forth in that article about why it could have happened. But at the end of the day, Zerlina, we have Pfizer, which is the first stop of several that have promising data and will get approval most likely this week. And yet we are not going, they are not going to be able to give the additional doses that we might ask for on top of what they've already promised us until probably July. Pfizer has made it really clear that worldwide demand will kind of put our needs towards the end of the line after what we've already been purchased, what we have purchased. So I, what I wanna do though is not scare people. We actually do have several manufacturers as Secretary Sebelius said. Mm-hmm. And so we are hoping that more and more of these manufacturers come online in the next several months, if it's safe, if it's effective, and therefore we have options. But Zerlina, watching the, the data come out and not being able to say that we could have had a chance to have 100 million people vaccinated, et cetera, is it's really heartbreaking when you look at the toll it's taking on Americans. 
particularly because there's not really any clarity on, uh, to your point, the reason behind them uh, refusing to to uh, get those extra doses. Secretary Sibelius, today President Trump signed an, an executive order. I don't really know what it means, but he says um, it will prevent other countries from getting U.S. Uh, supplies of the vaccine until Americans have gotten those supplies. This morning, the head of Operation Warp Speed um, was asked about the executive order and didn't even know enough about it to comment. Let's take a look. Can you explain this executive order the president is going to be putting out? I, I don't quite understand. He's saying that uh, foreign countries aren't going to be able to get the vaccine until everybody here in the United States gets it. It sounds like the problem is the opposite right now. Pfizer has made deals with other countries that are going to limit the supply here. Frankly, I don't know. And frankly, I'm saying out of this, I can't comment. I, I, don't, I literally know? don't know. As George Stephanopoulos pointed out, the problem does seem to be the opposite right now. Um, what do you make of the fact that the person in charge of this vaccine effort didn't know about this executive order? Well, I think, unfortunately, once again, um, President Trump is just inventing his own reality and has nothing to do with contracts that the pharmaceutical companies are making with not only the United States, but countries around the world. Uh, there's a major international effort called COVAX, which is securing vaccine for developing countries. The United States has refused to participate in that. We've refused to participate in funding vaccine candidates internationally. We refused to participate in the WHO. And somehow, um, I don't think President Trump understands contracts very well, that his executive order has no bearing whatsoever on the kind of contracts that both the United States government has executed with Pfizer and Moderna and others, but also other governments have executed. Uh, those are the ones that stand. That's what makes this tragedy, uh, as Dr. Patel has said, even more poignant. I think what the president's trying to do is pretend that he did not have a chance to get another uh, 50 million doses, that he did not turn down that opportunity, and now says there's an executive order that I'm going to sign that will make all this vaccine available in the United States. That's just absolutely not true. He also, I might say, Zerlina said yeah, yeah. in that same press conference that it's wonderful mm -hmm. we have so many cases of COVID in this country. So it was a totally nuts uh, presentation by the president of the United States. Anybody who could cheer 285,000 deaths, anybody who could cheer the fact that we have over 100,000 people in the hospital and 15 million infected Americans. I mean, this makes no sense at all. Yeah, it feels like it's back when he was saying, if you if you have more tests, you'll have more cases. <laughs> it's like it's it's it's, it's yeah. like it, he can't stop saying things that are 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 so upsetting, particularly because the reality is, as you said, two hundred and almost three hundred thousand Americans uh, have passed away in in just this year. Secretary Sebelius, I also want to ask you about uh, you know the hope at the end of this long dark tunnel because. President-elect Joe Biden rolled out his health care team. You led HHS under President Obama. As someone who has done the job, talk about the challenges that lie ahead for Javier Becerra if he's confirmed by the Senate. Well, I think Javier Becerra is a, a magnificent choice. I had the opportunity to work with Congressman Becerra uh, when I first came into office. He was a key lieutenant on passing the Affordable Care Act and making sure that the House coalitions um, were on board and that uh, the law contained the important pieces of expansion of Medicaid and access to uh, individuals uh, who were lower income. He totally believes that health care is a right, not a um, tied to geography or employment, but it's a right for American people. He also, importantly, has worked on issues like uh, immigrant children crossing the border on access to health care for lower income black and brown communities. On mm -hmm. He's taken on the opioid crisis as attorney general. He's been at the front lines of fighting to defend the Affordable Care Act. And he's run a major enterprise. The California Justice Department is a, is a big deal operation with lots of employees and lots mm -hmm. of different offices. So I think he is... Uh, very well suited to come into what is a very tough job. I'm really pleased that there's a side-by-side -side COVID group who will wake up every morning and think mm -hmm. COVID 24-7.
HHS has 11 operating agencies, everything from the NIH and FDA and CDC to children and families issues and aging and mental health and drug abuse. So the HHS secretary absolutely will be involved in working on COVID, but has to also pay attention to all of these other critical services and supports that Americans rely on every day. So they have a you know, a great announcement that there'll be a team thinking nothing but COVID from the time they wake up in the morning till the time they go to bed, both economically and on the health side, and then a very skilled secretary to, you know, begin to rebuild that team across HHS. It's so, so critically important to have competent people running these, these large bureaucracies. It, it, it does um, matter. That literally impact people's lives. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Kavita Patel and Kathleen Sebelius, thank you so much for being here and for breaking all of that down for us.